Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed part one of my conversation with Mark Pigpen Garrison um, about his experiences flying Huey helicopters, um, gunships in Vietnam. Uh, this will be part two. Again, check out irreverentwarriors.com for everything they do to learn about their amazing mission and to participate. That's the biggest thing. I want you to participate in a Silky's hike. And if you see me running around, my beard's a lot shorter. My last um, episode, I was more lumberjackish, but now I'm more like 80s porn star with my with my beard. So just look for me. Um, you can't miss me I'm running around uh, with a microphone shoving in people's faces. Uh, what else? Oh, 21gun.net for everything 21gun. www. Why do I say that? Why do I do the, the whole beginning? I'm just going to start. I, it makes me feel old. Like when my dad uh, tells me of a, a website, he, he gives me the whole W. It's like a generational thing. So apparently uh, I'm old. Uh, so anyways, hope you enjoy part two. I got a question. I just kind of want to go back to what we talked about before. And I'm, and I'm asking more in the context of the Vietnam where a lot of guys were drafted and they didn't want to be there. And there was a country that didn't really respect anybody in, in our war. And I, I spent a year in Iraq and I had another year in Afghanistan. So, you know, and then being a platoon commander and a company commander, I think it, for me, it, it wasn't that difficult. Well, I, I think it's always difficult to inspire and lead, but I have a feeling that for you guys, it was much more of a challenge to really inspire the guys to go above and beyond and and to, to push the extra mile and, and to make things happen. So I'm just kind of curious your experiences in that. And then how did you guys go about, you know, making, making it happen? If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. We were kind of, our situation was rather ancillary to that, that you described. There was a tremendous camaraderie between the pilots because we all depended on each other and we knew it. And it, it was just a natural occurrence for everybody to work together or everybody died together. It was that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And we weren't responsible for directly for the, what we call the grunts or the, and I don't mean that disrespectfully. I've got the greatest respect for those guys. I mean, they had, we still call uh, them grunts. <laughs> They're still, yeah. They love it. They love being called grunts. Well, at least in the Marines yeah, they do. Yeah. They had horrible conditions and, but we weren't re responsible for their, uh, you know, keeping them up to snuff, except for the fact that they loved us and hated us both. They had a love hate relationship. They hate, they loved us when we come and got them and they hated us when we took them out. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but they love to see all of them will tell you they love, they still love to hear the whop, 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 and you know, the rotor blade. And uh, so we had a great relationship with the. Uh, the guys on the ground because we were we were their saviors, you know. Sure, we, were supposed, yeah. we were supposed to be, and then a gunship. The, the incredible pressure on you was the fact that, I mean, many times the North Vietnamese would be. These are North Vietnamese regulars. The Viet Cong had been pretty well wiped out in the Tet in 1968. They were still around, but. North Vietnamese regulars were really well-trained and disciplined troops. You know, they were sometimes 30, 20 or 30 feet away from who you were trying to save in a gunship. And they would be running through the... Did you... Did you uh, Mike, did you have Prick 25s or did you guys have Prick 25 radios or were they gone? Uh we had, I think, prick. I, th I remember prick nineteens. Yeah, <laughs> that's we, the number I remember. Yeah, we had those in our uh, survival vest, prick nineteens, I believe. They're the ones where you could. Well, the survival ones are probably different than the the prick twenty fives, but yeah, I know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were on the back. These guys would be running, and I'm gonna recount a few of these in the book about they'd be running through the jungle and whispering and going, "We." Can you, uh, can anybody help us? 
give us pop smoke. Can't, can't, they'll give her a position why we can't. They're right on us. They're right on us. Well, they were, and you could hear the branches hitting them in the face, and they were terrified. But we couldn't do anything if they didn't mark them, their position with smoke, or we might kill them. Sure, yeah. 30 feet is not far away. No, and you really had to be accurate. And we were the last guys that really, you see, we were the ones that had to develop all of the helicopter war strategy because it was the first time it had ever been done. Yeah, that was something I, was, I wanted to bring up with you. You were going into combat with new technology. I mean, they had used it, but not, not in the way that you guys were flying with it. No, no. I mean, every day was a learning experience. And usually it was a racetrack pattern you developed where one guy was breaking. That's your most vulnerable. Sure, yeah, and your belly's up. He's laying minigun and rockets underneath. And then he comes around and he recovers your break in a racetrack. And you try to find a way to, a place to break long, short, right, left, whatever, where you're not receiving fire. Sometimes you couldn't do that. Yeah. You never, you learn never to overfly the enemy unless you absolutely had to. Mm -hmm. And because that was, that was just asking for it. Yeah, those tactics. And and we brought that up a lot when I would be in my tactic classes that, um, yeah. you know, the, the, tax, the tactics were written by, by the guys in Vietnam. So we... Yeah, we were the ones that developed it. And it was a trial on our basis. It really was. You didn't know what was going to work when it wasn't. Uh, so you just had to go out and just try it. Um, there's this weird dichotomy about war or being in a combat zone or something like that. It's it, it, without using a, a cheesy cliche, but it, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. There were times where it was just awful. You didn't want to be there. There were times where you were just bored off your ass. But then there were those times where you're playing poker or where the entire crew is working just, you know, when you're just on it where, where everybody is just on their a game and you're getting the job done and you everybody's just, in, we call everybody's in the zone. That's right. That's right. And you look back on that and you say, like when I look back on Iraq, I, you wouldn't get me there. I, I'll never go back to Iraq, but uh, I still, there's, there's this part of me and I almost kind of feel guilty about it. There's a part of me that enjoyed it. I enjoyed uh, being there as much as when I was there, I wanted to come home, but <laughs> Well, yeah, but you know, that the human being has a great capacity for adaptation. And that's what you were showing is your ability to adapt mm -hmm. and, and actually make a good situation out of a bad one. You know, and I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. We, I, I developed bonds with these pilots. And since I've read the book, I've heard from all kinds of guys that I hadn't heard from in I don't know how long. And uh, it was just the bonds are just lifelong. Yeah, and th very, very strong. I think, and it's an important thing too. Uh, one of the things I noticed because when I got out of the military, I, I went to grad school, uh, and I'm just curious about about this question: How do you find it is working with with civilians, people who have never served in the military? Did you find that a little difficult and? Uh, you, like when I would go to grad school, I had a I had a task to do. I had the discipline to get it done, and then if I didn't do it right, I didn't quibble. I just I just learned from my mistake and moved on. A lot of these kids who are in their twenties and very very small percentage of of my generation actually served. It's only like a half a percent. Yeah. These these I'll, guys would just quibble. I'll answer, that. I'll answer that by finishing your sentence for you. Okay. <laughs> I found them naive. Uh, didn't understand the world, didn't understand what real violence really was, didn't understand that it took hard work to get something done that was worthwhile. Sure. That's what I found. Sure. Uh, which I think is, is also important, and, and I don't want to be the one to break this to you, but uh, Vietnam has become uh, the grandfather's war. When I grew up, it was our father's war, and now you got a, a bunch of kids who are coming of age who this is their grandfather's war, and they're losing touch of that for two reasons. Yeah. One, yeah. I mean, you guys are in your late 60s, 70s, and in 20 years, yeah. you know, 80s and 90s, um, we're going to start losing that connection with folks from Vietnam. The second thing about that is we're in an era of revisionist history. 
yeah. where, you know, and, and you know what, what, I mean, I don't have to go into detail about that, but it's important for you to tell your story and for you to get your story out there. And it's important for them to read about it. Well, yeah, that's why I was so, uh, so uh, eager to do this interview with you guys, because uh, I want to get this story to as many people as I can get it to, because I really think it's important. If it, if it will prevent one more ill-advised war or skirmish, if it would prevent one more death or even one more injury, then it's all worth it to me. You see what I'm saying? Absolutely. So you, because I saw so much violence and God Almighty, it was just horrific. And then when you come back and see that it was all really for naught because of a bunch of goddamn politicians. That's right. And and they they sure as hell weren't out there. If if I could have got them out, if got them in one gunship mission and they had to do that every day, there wouldn't have been any war, guys. Don't don't you think um Iraq was is kinda like that? Politician Iraq? politician led? Iraq is the stupid I, I don't. I have a tendency just to say what I feel and not bullshit. You guys might not agree with me, but I'm going to tell you what I feel. <laughs> uh, I think Iraq was the stupidest son of a bitch that we ever could have done. I mean, it's, it was like Iraq didn't knock down the World Trade Centers. It would have been like El, it would have been like FDR uh, attacking Argentina after Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Yeah, I don't disagree with you. Do you think it's any coincidence that the guys who were in charge of all that, uh, some were military. I think Rummy was, uh, Rumsfeld was military and, and Bush was military, but none of them served combat. Uh, that's not no. a coincidence. Bush, I don't know. He thought God told him to run for president. And they might, <laughs> but tell me that. What we call that in chiropractic school when we took introductory psychiatry. Anybody that thought, well, you can tell me he's a PA. What we learned, we learned that anybody that thought they'd talk to God was, was called a schizophrenic. That's, that's right. I don't like my, my commander uh, who has their finger on the button to hear voices. I just, it doesn't yeah, make me sit right. It's not a comfortable feeling. And he actually told people that. Um, but yeah, you said something, yeah. yeah, not to get on that track, but you were saying, um, the, the Vietnam being, you know, uh, a war fought out of politics. Don't you think that that the military is the is the strong arm of the political will? I mean, I think all, aren't all wars fought for some political reason? Uh, yes, I think of course they are because, in a, especially in a democracy like ours, it's it, that's why it has civilian leaders that and the commander in chief who's civilian and, and the legislature and all that. Who, order that declare war and the military does what they're told to do. But that's so there's what, always some, I guess there's always some, there's always, there's always a political reason or political will behind it. We don't. Uh, yeah. Even but World I, War II was, it was politics. Well, I think uh, World War II was probably necessary though. Yeah. That one. I think, yeah, you're probably, you're right on that one. That was yeah, World War one was, was, was pretty yeah. ass. I that was knew. awful. That yeah, was, that was you, some awesome. goddamn arch Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Yeah, that was pretty yeah. silly, but it was pol- yeah, the politics. Yeah, got the shot, so they, everybody killed millions of people over. Can't believe it. Human beings. Sometimes I think war is a is a depopulating evolutionary advice. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm really halfway serious. Consider the idea. They did experiment experiments with rats. Okay. And Kevin, I think being in medicine, you'd be quite interested in this. And, and so would you though, know, Mike, mm-hmm. I read, this was an index peer reviewed study. Uh, Meaning, of course, that it is repeatable and they come up with the same results. And they put a bunch of rats in this area and they they let them uh, congregate, uh, breed and get crowded. 
and run short of food. And so they all broke up into little factions and they bore, they rats are really pretty intelligent and they broke up into factions and they formed gangs and the gangs would kill one another and stake out their territory. No shit. <laughs> God, well, here, here's, here's, the, here's the kicker. So then they started taking some more variables out of it. They did the same experiment, except they gave them all the food and water they wanted to drink. And they, but they let it get filthy and they still broke up into gangs and stuff. And then the, the, the last thing they did was they kept it clean as hell. They gave them everything they wanted to eat, everything they wanted to drink, and they still killed one another in gangs. So the conclusion was it was the crowd that did it. Wow. So that's why I said what I just said. I wonder, you know, you notice every, people fight wars over the craziest damn reasons. Yeah, yeah, and some, and, and there's more wars statistically in crowded areas. It just happens. So you know, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do about it. But the world gets together on a paper and get a PhD. I hope I hope we get it right because um, now now I have a, a toddler son, and you know I never really thought about it as a father. Now that. Uh, I mean, I've been to uh, a combat zone. My father was in the Navy. My grandfather was in World War II. Uh, my great-grandfather. I mean, I have relatives all the way back to the Civil War all had to go and fight. Well, and we just haven't figured it out. And I, I don't want my son, you know, to have to, to figure this out, too. I mean, to, to have to go and fight somewhere. And and what's the common denominator? You don't have the word senator or representative in front of my name. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, the song from uh, Credence comes to mind. Yeah, for, Senator's son, for, or Fortunate Son. Fortunate ones, or Fortunate Son. I'm no fortunate one. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, the Fogarty nailed that. Sure. Because no, there wasn't any Senator's sons over there or whatever. George Bush didn't go either. Nope. George Bush intention national, our national guard wasn't he national yeah. texas national, texas texas yeah, what guard? Got, what wasn't even real got, was it well you guys are a lot younger than i am you gotta understand one thing back in those days the national guard was the way out of back to military duty now it's a way in oh sure it is yeah but, but back then if you wanted that there were lines and lines of people there were hankering to get in the National Guard because they knew they'd never see Vietnam if they did. Yeah. And, uh, but now, of course, that's different because of the volunteer army, but then it was a draft army. Here's, here's a, a side question. Just curious. When was the first time you heard of the country Vietnam, if you can remember? It was in the early 1960s. And the reason I remember it was because of good looking women. And I was in, uh, blossoming young male <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, because they had a picture of the most beautiful women in the world or something in life magazine and it had the, the girls of vietnam and, and they really were pretty and then but i didn't know anything more about it than that and it's funny how you bring up good-looking vietnamese women because i, I believe i read a story about you getting a, a massage and falling asleep <laughs> and having nothing but yeah. your that was a story that was also very true. Right. As a matter of fact, there was a lot truer than the truth that I put down. <laughs> I wondered about that. I wondered about that, but I, you know, you got to. <laughs> no, I mean, man, that was a close call. That really was a close Sure, call. that sounded I, awful. I was, I was in a damn alley, and I can still, I can still feel the wetness on my face and, I broke my damn toe on a well. <laughs> and had my boots on. And I couldn't make it. Couldn't make it. I had my forty-five pulled. I had three or four clips. Can you uh, can you recap that story for the listeners? Kind of let them let them know exactly what happened and how you got there. Sure, I can. Okay. Uh, I got to the Crocs, and these two guys came in. Like I said in the book, they'll remain nameless, and they still will. You for said reason. Jake and Snake, I believe, in the book. I, I said. <laughs> call them Jake and Snake for the, for just for the ease of it. But anyway, uh, 
they said, I said, what are you guys doing here anyway? And they, they got to roll me out of bed. I mean, grab me and roll me out of bed. And said uh, that you haven't been initiated properly into the Crocs yet. So you're coming with us. Your mission has been scrubbed. So they got him, they commandeered the jeep and they roared in the town. I thought for sure I was going to die on the way in there. I was hanging on for a dear life in the back, and he was hitting every pothole in the road. And I thought I was going to bounce out of the damn thing. <laughs> but then we went to a tailor shop downtown. Got us. They got picked up suits. Well, you can get a really nice suit, Hong Kong tailor, for like. It was a hundred bucks. It was three piece. It was worsted wool. It was really nice suit. I still got the one I bought. I can't wear it. Um, maybe uh, I get half of me in it. <laughs> 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 but anyway, uh, it's still after all these years, it's still in great shape. But anyway, uh, then they took us down to the. It was called the. Uh, Mama Sons or some damn thing like that. You know, the whorehouse. I knew where they were taking me. And uh, then we got in there and they, these guys left with girls and I said I'd have a few beers first. And they came back after they did their little thing and said, are you still sitting here? And uh, they asked this girl to come over that had approached me before and I said, come back in a few beers and said, take uh, pig pen back here and show him a good time so by then I was ready to go and then she asked if I wanted a massage and I said sure you know and that's all I needed for sleep and I went to sleep and I woke up at 5 o'clock right at curfew and I went out and there was nothing but civilians out there and all the soldiers were back on base and I oh, thought hell I'm screwed now and uh, so I knew I had to hide somewhere that night because the the North Vietnamese sympathizers were all over the cities. And if they knew you were down there, they'd cut your throat in a heartbeat. And I looked all over for this girl, and so I couldn't find her, and I went out to the alley and thought, well, that's where I'm going to have to stay. There was an alley that run behind all the businesses that uh, was – there were their wells there so often where their water supplies were and things like that. And uh, I was back there, and all of a sudden, this girl showed up. And I asked her, took the chance that she was friendly to, even at night, to American soldiers. So, and she was, and she asked me what I was doing there, and said that I, she heard I was there. And she took me to her apartment and put me up there. And uh, it wasn't very long. She left and went somewhere. And all of a sudden she came back in and she was talking real excitedly and said, you got to hide. You got to get out of here. <laughs> these, these men are coming. They're going to kill you. And all I had was this 45 and uh, my boots were by the door. They always take their shoes off at the door. And uh, so I ran out in the alley and I thought, oh, hell, I left my boots there. That's a nice calling card. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I ran behind a, a, a well, and I saw them through the window. And they were waving their arms, these guys were, they had weapons. They were waving their arms and yelling at the girl, and she was kind of yelling back. So I went down another well uh, a few feet down the alley, and then they came out. And I had it cocked and chambered and ready to, I thought, sure, I was a goner. And, uh, but anyway, she was, she was, uh, a true South Vietnamese girl that wanted, uh, democracy and not communism. And she didn't, did not like the North Vietnamese. And, and didn't you say you were worried, uh, that if they did get you, what type of letter your mom would have got? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, I said uh, that, uh, I could just see the headlines at home that, Worn off the garrison, uh, gunned down. I guess gunned down by sharpshooting whores <laughs> in a brothel, uh, drunk and disorderly. <laughs> My mother would be so proud of me. <laughs> I but think, anyway, oh they no, came sorry. out in the alley. They came out in the alley and waving around out there. I thought, sure, they were going to find me and we're going to have to shoot it out. 
And um, but anyway, they they left back in, and then they left, and I stayed all night there. And then then when the the I couldn't wait for the rooster to crow. I tell you, and I got I caught a military truck when the the curfew was off and the morning post opened up again and just rolled back in like nothing had happened. <laughs> no, nobody uh, noticed you were uh, gone in the, on base. No, well, yeah, they did. Like, the, he, guy, the guys there, Jake and snake will call you. The, they looked all over for me and looked and you know, they couldn't find me. And she had me back in some kind of a, it was like a maze back there. So I don't blame them. And they had to get back. And I was drunk and and massaged. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I was screwed, blued, and tattooed. (laughs) (laughs) Is is there any uh, any dumber thing to do than to take young eighteen to twenty five year old men, give him? Give them machines of destruction uh, and put them in a foreign country where, well, there's <laughs> liquor whores and. <laughs> yeah, you make a ballot of very salient point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and that's, that's why, that's why, you know, they have middle aged men commanding teenagers. <laughs> if, if teenagers were in charge, they'd really have things fixed. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Testosterone abounds, you know. That's right. I remember reading in your book, um, you were exposed to Agent Orange um, pretty extensively on multiple occasions. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, but Agent Orange is the worst thing that's happened to me. We, we had to... There, there's a uh, an aircraft. They covered... They carried Agent Orange... In 123 providers, Kevin, are you familiar with that aircraft? I, I believe so. Uh, it was a uh, tail dragger. Uh, uh, I don't remember whether it was a tail dragger or not. I didn't pay that much attention to it. It was when it was on the ground. I usually picked them up on the road in the air war. Okay. Oh, I'm um, thinking. I'm thinking the C-47. Uh, that's what. That's what. Oh, I'm you're thinking about. of the DC-3. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought the provider was a nose gear, but I'm not sure. But anyway, there were C-123 providers. As a matter of fact, there's one in the United States Air Force Museum, and its name is Patches. And its claim to fame is that it took, it's, it took more than 600 hits in Vietnam. Wow. And, and I describe a lot of those missions. And when we had to go out in gunships and, and escort those guys. And we, you'd be back behind them in like a f- seven or five o'clock position, higher and back. And they'd, they'd always receive fire, always. Those guys on the ground did not like that crap dumped on them. I don't blame them. And so they'd say, receiving fire, receiving fire, nine o'clock, 200 meters. And what you had to do, and, and it seems like always they just dumped the low of Agent Orange. It was just a big cloud. But what you had to do is see, you'd look down and see the muzzle flash. So you had to fly right toward it. And doing that, you flew through the cloud. And you mentioned a while ago, Kevin, about how you couldn't hear rounds, but we could because all of our doors were open. Mm -hmm. Well, all that shit flew in through the doors and our flight suits were wet with it. And that happened to me a hundred times if it happened once. Hmm. And I was diabetic uh, before I left Vietnam. I weighed 165 pounds. I bench pressed 250. I had abs. And the the guy that diagnosed the Beach Army Hospital, his name is Major Marvin Brooks, sent me to the lab three times. And uh, he he said, I don't know. They're making a mistake. You, You can't have diabetes. And finally, he had to admit that I did have it. He said, I've never seen it before in my medical career. But they didn't know what Agent Orange was doing back then. No, no. And uh, so I've dealt with that for 40-some years, and I'm running into problems now. With, do, you, and, uh, do you have any do, children? Yeah, and two of them I wonder about whether some problems they have – 
Well, well, you know, they've put spina bifida as a official side effect. Mm-hmm. First generation. Well, my oldest son has a spina bifida occulta. He has low back problems now through an injury that really shouldn't have hurt him. That's disabled him for six years. What's What's amazing about that is that these are injuries from a war for, with people that were never even alive during it, not even uh, considered. Yeah. Right? You think yeah, too in Vietnam? Crazy. In Vietnam, they're 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 having the same issue. Yeah. Do you know? Do you know, when I researched the book, do you know why they put dioxin, that terrible poison, in in Agent Orange? Agent Orange is basically just uh, a glorified roundup. But do you know why they put dioxin in it? No idea. I always thought it was a killed plant. I mean, what the hell? It's obvious, right? But it wasn't. It was an adhesive agent. It it made it stick to the plant where rain would even wash it off. Well, see, that happened to us, too. Because a lot of times when you were flying these uh, missions to protect these birds, these providers, you you were remaining overnight. You were RONing, and you couldn't change clothes, let alone shower, for a couple of days. So, and, that, and hell, all of us are diabetic, uh, Kevin. I, the, the guys who were out in the field. Really? It, well, it's because, it's because Agent Orange is what did it. It's what, that's what the VA tells me. In uh, 07, they gave me another lethal, fatal diagnosis. They said I had myelodysplasia. And they took three bone marrow, as, aspiration bone marrow uh, biopsies and three board-certified Hematologist, oncologist agreed. So they said I had 18 months, and I didn't say anything to the family because I maybe I was denying it, but I didn't want to worry them. I went back two years later because I was still alive. (laughs) (laughs) And they 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 gave me another uh, aspiration bone marrow biopsy and said I had six months. Then I told the family I was supposed to be dead in 09. And um, oh, wow. I did. Yeah, this this is. And anyway, I went. I've been anemic ever since I came back from Vietnam. For and they say that's all Agent Orange too. This is wicked shit. This dioxin is, and it's long term. Yeah. But anyway, uh, I started doing some things that I thought might stimulate the marrow because another. Name for monosplasia is pre leukemia or bone marrow failure. But I didn't have many blast cells, if any, so it gave me a little bit of hope. And uh, so I took, I lay down in the sun until I got black, Kevin, trying to stimulate <laughs> <laughs> the marrow. And I took vitamin uh, cholecalciferol, you know, D3 and all kinds of shit. Just anything I could think of to try to affect the outcome. And I made an appointment at Mayo Clinic. And I went down there, and whether I did it or whatever happened, or it was a spontaneous remission or whatever, uh, they, they run me through every test in the book. And when I, got to, I read the report, got to page 7, I said, this patient has a normal marrow. Gosh, and I went down there and said, thinking that I was a dead man, and I came back with a damn iron pill. So that's what you call dodging the bullet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so. Looking back on it, um, if you were given the opportunity to not have been to to Vietnam, let's say you could go back in time and change it, would you do that, or or is it part of you now, or is it something that? Uh, that's really a difficult question. I, I, I think my initial, I don't think I would change it for one reason, I, because I learned so much about what's important in life and what isn't mm-hmm. that I would not have learned otherwise. You know what I mean? Yeah. Guts and gunships, the true story of what, what it was really like to fly combat helicopters in Vietnam. That's right. And it's linked to, I have a link on it on my website, uh, waitwhatif.com. I put it up on um, uh, my Twitter and my Facebook because uh, I've been really pushing this this uh, this interview. I, I, I 
I've been doing a lot to make sure that people know that this one's going to be out there. I appreciate that. It's become our grandfather's war now, and it's, it's you know. Yeah. yeah, it has. And, you know, the story needs to be told by more. People ought to write their stories down because, damn it, they'll be buried with them if they don't. And I appreciate you guys getting hold of me and allowing me to do this. No, this is this is fantastic. I appreciate it. Appreciate you, you know you told some personal stories and and it was fantastic. Well, you guys have been great, and I like your sense of humor. <laughs> uh, no, the, the email uh, string we had going, we ought to publish that. That was hysterical. <laughs> I was I was half convinced you were going to do this interview in a loincloth. <laughs> <laughs> what I damn near did. I damn near put that parrot on my shoulder and put an eye patch on it. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know how, how far your sense of humor went. <laughs> that been great. Yeah, that would have been really good. Uh, All right. Oh, trust but me. You, but, you, <laughs> but you lied to me, Kevin. Yeah. You said you guys were two bearded goons, and I only saw one. <laughs> yeah. In, in between, in between me emailing you, I had uh, what I like to call a class one A failure of my um, my beard, and I kept I kept trying to fix it, and I'd shave it lower and lower, and then I was like, out of hell with it, and I just took it off. So it's it's on its way back, but exactly what I do. My wife tells me when I grow beard, she can tell me it's hard because it starts getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> it's a little bitty pencil mustache. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> can, can I ask you real quick, since we're, sure. since we're completely off track right now, or off topic, and we're wrapping it up. Um, yeah, do, okay. do, do you drink? Do you drink? What's your drink of choice, if, if I could ask? If you, or if you don't. You know, I, I used to flat slugger down. And I, but uh, I don't drink much anymore. But you guys said uh, that you had a few on the podcast, so I've joined you here with this white here. I thought I thought maybe you didn't. I was curious what it was that you were drinking. <laughs> this, this bourbon. Oh, You're, I'm I'm a I'm a bourbon guy myself. They really flatten your wallet out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they do. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was never into it, and then Mike moved in next door to me, and uh, I went over there, and one of the first things he showed me is like, "Hey, look at my my whiskey collection," and <laughs> it's it's it would put most people to shame. So I slowly got into it. <laughs> a distillery in West Virginia. I don't know if you've heard of Smooth Ambler. They have a whiskey called Old no, Scout. Uh, no. What about you, Kevin? I I have a very um, sensitive and refined palate. <laughs> have you ever heard of uh, Have you ever heard of Old Crow? <laughs> there you go, eight dollars a bottle. <laughs> yeah, the the problem is the problem is with my drinking, which I, I try to curtail every now and then, is I have two alarm clocks. Um one is a two year old toddler girl and the other one's a three year old toddler boy. And um I'll tell you what, six AM is very, very early after you've put away uh, some whiskey, so <laughs> Look, I will tell you I've raised four children. And, uh, my God, now there's, I'd rather go back and get off here and do that again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's nice meeting, nice meeting you, Moraine. Hey, you I, too. I, I flew, I, I flew for you guys over there sometimes. Oh yeah. How was that? That, that had to have been a little well, bit different. I mean, they got, they got into trouble on the ground. Always. <laughs> well, listen guys, it's been great. Yeah, man. A lot of, it's been a lot of fun. I'm sure we'll talk again. Yeah, if I can do anything for either one of you, just let me know. All right, I appreciate that. Okay. All right, take care, Mark. Okay, take care, guys. Like us on Facebook.com slash WWI Podcast and at WWI Podcast on Twitter. Drop us a line at WaitsWhatIfPodcast at Yahoo.com. Listen to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or TuneIn Internet Radio.
you enjoyed your listening experience. Now go forth and expand your reality.